Hi there, welcome back to the Dylan Rounds case. Welcome if you're currently here in the live premiere. Today what I want to do is catch up on some recent comments from two videos by a couple of individuals where it be questions that need to be answered or key points made by people in the community of the Dylan Rounds case. I want to look back over it all, catch up on it now before we drift away from it because there are other talking points and topics that need to be looked at and addressed, whether that be Dylan Rounds or a bit on Kenny Veach. So that's what I want to do today. If it opens up any other new ideas or discussions, then maybe it can be incorporated. I mean, first of all, I can share with you my thoughts on Chase Venstra. What do I think about him? Does he apply to the Dylan Rounds case and to what extent? I'll get into that shortly. For those that are watching this live premiere right now, feel free to share your thoughts, opinions, reactions in the live chat box on the right hand side of the screen. If you'd like to leave comments in general, you know, watching at any point, any moment, leave all your thoughts down below and I can always respond back to them at a later point. If you simply want to catch up on my latest videos, top right corner of the screen, click on that eye symbol and you'll be able to find them. What I did do was create a new YouTube Shorts to do the Kenny Veach case, making the observation, highlighting the contradictions made by Kenny Veach when describing the M cave. Now I could do it as a standalone normal format video, but I thought doing it as a short, it might reach a broader audience. I can always replicate it again and do it in a standard format video. So regular viewers can check it themselves, okay? So feel free to watch that when you've got time and some previous videos too. Down below under this video in the comment section pinned by me will be some additional links if you wish to check them out and if you want to support this channel in some way or another. Shout out to Ellen Berg in recent time for her support on the channel. Much appreciated there. And yeah, that's about it for that. Just as a heads up, there's a range of different videos to come, right? Some on Dylan Rounds, others elsewhere, Kenny Veach. Now, maybe the next video will be about Kenny Veach. I'm taking into consideration when it comes to those news articles, new and old, they can disappear with time. When I was going through some articles which I saved back in 2022, which I covered in 24, some of them did not exist anymore. The pages, error codes, the lot. So it's best to get over and done with soon before we can never find it again. So maybe the next video that I do will be on Kenny Veach, a couple of them, okay? I'd rather do it whilst it's available. In addition, there is another Kenny Veach M Cave related video, more of a response one to a channel I believe called Unsolved Mysteries, established over a million, nearly two million maybe subscribers. But how they were talking and how they presented it was very odd. They didn't introduce Kenny Veach until halfway through the video and how they started the video they were referring to as he or they found this, found that but no word on Kenny Veach specifically. I don't know if the person was speaking in third person or they were referring to Kenny all along or it seemed more likely that they were referring to somebody else out there, an investigator, a searcher that left comments online claiming to have found the entrance to the M cave. All that will be addressed and explained and also debunked and cleared up for when that video comes, which could be in a few days time. Gotta get all the previous material together to put my counterpoints up and to just simply highlight that what's been pointed out, what's been claimed to have been found, can't be the M cave and there's a reason for it. As with the discussion of the time, the day, the way the sunshine is, the light and the shadows are casted, that can impact and obscure the vision of a hiker trying to look for the cave, but in terms of the positioning of it, that does need to be addressed. So be on the lookout for that video when the time does come. But as I said, right now, let's just focus on Dylan Rounds. I also want to mention another key point, okay? Maybe I didn't mention it before, but I will highlight it. Whilst it is important to cover this case, because not really anyone else will do nowadays, for numerous reasons, um, and besides keeping the case alive in general to spread the awareness, the other key thing is, 
as I've said in the past, like with mysteries, whenever there is resistance of the right level, it'll only encourage me to continue on. It's like a sign. You're close to the truth. You're on the right path. Keep doing what you're doing, right? What about the Dylan Rounds case? Because surely there's been resistance there. There has. Now, maybe most of the resistance in the Dylan Rounds case isn't so much those who are responsible for the death of Dylan Rounds. So when you think of the feral community, the nut community, the giggling community, okay? People over that way, some disease-ridden humans in here, their mindset, their toxicity, and hatred obsessions with me. Those type of people out there, whilst they have shown resistance towards me, undermined me, slandered my name with fake statements such as Ty Corbin, Buster Bratimus, and many more, smile now, cry later, about clickbait titles, even though there is no proof of that when you look at the English language and how it's arranged. It all comes down to perception, and sometimes it can be an invalid one. So they've slandered my name, and other people have tried ridiculing me. That type of resistance isn't because they're responsible for the death of Dylan Rounds, they're just doing it because they don't like how I cover stuff and how consistent I am, and the fact that I'm single-handedly carrying the Dylan Rounds case on my back, specifically on YouTube, from 2022 till 24. And because of my recent return, it's triggered that emotion again within unstable individuals who are a bit erratic at times, okay? So it is about understanding levels of resistance. For what reason, what motive, who by? Is it those responsible for the case or those just responsible for trying to cause disruption and recklessness, right? And it's the latter in this case. Does it encourage me any more like how the Kenny Veach case did when it came to resistance there? Yeah, arguably even more so, okay? Because when you take in consideration all these people over time who have been a part of the case themselves, they've shown their caring side towards the case, Dylan, maybe even the family, but they've also shown their dark side, what they've said in the background behind people's backs, maybe on other channels and how they supported and enabled them, okay? And many other names out there, okay? Like the Polish Karen in Vegas, obsession with me, constant hatred towards those that covered the Dylan Rounds case and basically show it from different perspectives. I said, bad example of a human, but there are many out there, okay? more so in the US compared to other countries, who knows? I only cover, or I have covered US cases, so it attracts a US audience. I can't compare that to, geographically speaking, other places out there. It's not possible at this moment. But let me tell you something. Whilst others out there encourage me to cover cases in my own country, I choose not to because I do what I want to and what I find interesting. And I do feel confident that even if I did cover a case in even in my country, it would not attract the majority of the UK, okay? The UK majority don't quite, I don't know, not interested in me, my channel, but the US more so dominated there. The only time when the UK audience takes over is YouTube short videos, and you know why? It's simply because the way the YouTube algorithm is and how, who it targets, it targets the country where you're from and, you know, the videos where you upload from, okay? It's like with TikTok, it's like with YouTube, it's the same thing. But normal format videos can attract a wider range of audiences from different countries. But because a lot of people who use YouTube are from the likes of the US, India, they tend to dominate more in statistics across all channels out there, right? You might have some exceptions, you might have a niche which then targets the correct group, but, you know, it might not happen all the time, okay? But to refer back to the whole resistance part with the Dylan Rounds case, it encourages, it encourages me to continue on, okay? Whilst, yes, granted, at times I'll incorporate certain themes of conflict within the case and community to make a valid point. Because it's also 
besides keeping the case alive, it's also important to highlight the bad people who were once perceived as good individuals. If Candace Cooley, Justin Rounds have been deceived by these individuals out there, there's no harm in spreading awareness, right, as to where their allegiances, loyalties lie, or once did. If everybody wants to go after Doug Hutton, mm, no thanks, because of what he said about Dylan and who he hung out with in the past, well, we should be spreading awareness on all the other people out there, the haters of Doug Hutton, and focus on those people who have been doing things in the Dylan Rounds case and supporting unfavorable, unsavory characters, okay? You go, for, you go for one, you go for all, simple as. You just go after one, cherry picking, witch hunt, typical. Just like how people went directly after Candice Cooley and only Candice Cooley. It's too one-sided. So you used to think, people could say, oh, are you defending standing up for Candice Cooley? If you look back to my past videos, there were critiques, there were observations made arguably in a more negative light, but I've also mentioned positives in recent time. It's that balance between the two. An individual isn't all and completely wholly negative. There are some positives from them, within them, right? Whether it has a positive effect on others or it's just within them, a strength or a weakness. It's worth highlighting. I've done the same with Justin Rounds. Now, there are lose-lose situations when it comes to certain behavior and action in the case, more so those within the case, within the investigation, right? That can be highlighted at a later point. But the reason why it encourages me the resistance from the unnecessary misfits to continue on covering this case, not because I see myself as the expert or the one that only knows about Dylan, because there'll be many other people out there will have some form of knowledge on the Dylan Rounds case, right? And maybe some may have more personal experiences with Dylan. Okay, but how you conduct yourself is very different to how I conduct myself. And I think that's the key point that stands out the most. So within the Dylan Rounds case, whilst other people are more than fine and happy to mess about and cause disruption, I want to be the one that actually can formally continue and cover videos. Whilst these former investigators or true crime supposed channels are not doing that no more. They're doing the opposite, which isn't that helpful nor necessary. You need at least one person to be present, right, within a case, so there's a bit of stability. Because if there's none, then what, what can you rely on? What can you fall back on? There's not much. And yeah, there's other communities out there, Facebook, etc. but YouTube is a big platform, right, and can be very influential. If it's done for the right reason, it can be helpful. If it's done for the wrong reason, as we've seen elsewhere, you see how that can go. Now, yes, Kenny of each case, people there slander my name or cause unnecessary disruption. It's happened, things, traces are still there. Am I, am I able to keep on top of it all? You can. Is it worth it when it could regenerate again in the future? And as well, YouTube are the most incompetent, useless bastards out there, okay? That's what YouTube is. They don't take action when it should be done. They'll allow Instagram, TikTok, only fan whores to advertise themselves, attention whores, all over the place. Oh, that's fine. Because they're a female. Because it sells. Yeah, because, what, people behind YouTube, desperate males, will bow down to that. Pathetic, right? There's a lot of double standards when it comes to these platforms, okay? Um, we're not talking about the typical political censorship. We're talking about the other stuff as well, right? Like the examples I've given. But that aside, has the Dylan Rounds case been censored on and off, indirectly or directly, as I've documented in my videos, okay? Does it put me off? Now, does it annoy me? Yes, but the videos still come with time. Fingers crossed that they remain. And yeah, how many videos have been taken down through things out of my control in the Dylan Rounds case? None, really. Not from what I can remember. The odd, the odd two in recent time to do that documentary in the past, it was blocked. It was restricted from different countries. 
just because I used a few seconds clip, BS. Watcher of drama, different individual out there, credit to them for covering the Dylan Rounds documentary in the past. They said in recent time that they also received a uh, like a copyright claim thing blocking from different countries so people couldn't view it anymore. So it's not just me. Bit hopeful. It, it just goes to show that there is a massive delay when it comes to copyright and it's one of the worst things to happen because if it doesn't happen immediately, how can you learn from your mistakes then? Because until um, until the wrong has been shown, until you've been shown what's gone wrong and what you've done wrong, during that delayed period, you're just going to keep making mistake after mistake after mistake. It's not your fault. It's not the creator's fault. It's YouTube for implementing inconsistent guidelines and also implementing punishment at a later date when it should have been done at the very start. So then that person would have felt the consequences and learned from their mistakes. But because you leave it too late, people are still making mistakes along the way and that accumulates by YouTube and then they really punish you. That's rubbish, right? Shouldn't be like that. So besides that, let's focus back on Dylan Rounds, Chase Fenstra. That's what we looked at most recently. Although the charges of Chase Fenstra and the massive high-valued bail on him does not link to Dylan Rounds, the charges are unrelated to Dylan Rounds. There were desperate people with time that were obsessed and trying to hint that what's happened to Chase Fenstra recently and the on and off things and being moved about is to do with Dylan Rounds secretly in the background. Now, what I suggested in the past, because let's be realistic here, when it came to Kevin Bibbins, I said, could the same happen with Kevin as it did with Brenner? Unrelated charges, but then because he's held somewhere, things are found on him which link to the Dylan Rounds case. Was that the case by the end? No. Okay. But how I worded it was different. I said, could unrelated charges on Kevin somehow link to the Dylan Rounds case in which whilst he's being held because of other unrelated things, other stuff in the background is found specifically with Dylan Rounds and then tied to Kevin, right? Kind of like how it happened with Brenner. That's all I was suggesting. It didn't happen on that occasion, but how it was worded, it was clear. How it's worded by others with Chase Venstra, not so clear. Some people hype it up, okay? And to be honest, Chase Venstra's name has been mentioned a lot. There's been a lot of stories, rumours and events from the past, during the Dylan Rounds case, the day of Dylan's death, etc. There's a lot of talk, arguably more talk than physical evidence. Candice Cooley did come across as a supporter or a defender of Chase Fenstra in the early days because she, she knew or she felt confident that he wasn't responsible for Dylan's death. So there must be enough evidence in the background for her to think that way. Justin Rounds too must think that way because have you ever seen Justin Rounds make a public post online saying, Chase Fenstra, I'm coming for you. I'm going to spill your guts. You've made a big mistake. No. Justin has been focused on Don Hatley instead. So that kind of sets a tone, doesn't it, for the direction of who else could be responsible or who else knows more besides Brenner, right? So it's worth taking that into mind. Um, do I personally believe that Chase Fenstra is involved? At least from how the story has been told, okay? Formally and in the background and on the news channels and it's not changed since despite what outsiders may claim as like an opposite story, right? I wouldn't say Chase Venstra is involved in Dylan's death, okay? Or the disposing of Dylan's death. What about the gun and key fob? Was he responsible for that? I just don't think there's enough evidence, is there? Because what doesn't help, gun and key fob was cleaned down, wiped off DNA, so you can't trace it back in that sense with actual evidence. But we're specifically speaking about Dylan Rounds. How was Dylan Rounds taken out and who by? 
I just don't think it was by Chase Venstra, okay? That's what I'm going to say. And the main reason for it is just because of the CCTV of him elsewhere, right? People say it wasn't verified, it wasn't confirmed to be Chase. Yet Candice Cooley said she was informed by the FBI, in which the FBI informed her about it. So, seems a bit odd, doesn't it, how people go against that. But, yeah, un unless there's more evidence to suggest Chase Venstra is involved, I've just not seen it yet. Okay, 25th of May, Chase Venstra picked up by Dylan. Right. But was Chase the last person to see Dylan from then? No. Because onwards, 26th, 27th, Dylan Rounds, brief presence of Taylina Kurt Wadsworth in Montello, as we've seen, as we've heard. And then you want to go to the 28th, Dylan in the presence of Brenner on the day and around the time. And within that 30 minute period, then Brenner in possession of Dylan's phone with blood on him. Yeah, it, it seems kind of self-explanatory that, doesn't it? Dylan rounds at the gate, eventually makes it down to the grain shed from the looks of it. And then, within that 30 minute period, then Brenner is in possession of Dylan's phone and has blood on him. Two people, on site, one takes the other person's phone, the other is missing. It does seem very obvious, doesn't it? I do understand there will be twist and there have been turns within the case, but some of the twists and turns have either been mistakes made by the LE in which Candice Cooley had to go against certain truths to try and protect the case, which then portrayed her as a liar and a bad person. But she did it because either she was advised to by the LE and their mistakes, or that she thought it would help the case, right? And with Justin Rounds, his behaviour could be seen as threatening language and behaviour, could harm the case, but determined and passionate about finding Dylan, finding answers, and going after those responsible Possibly, such as Don Hartley, right? So each person has their own ways and actions with dealing with the case and how they go about it. But from the outside, criticisms can be made very easily, right? I know I've mentioned critiques, but I've also complemented it with positives just to maintain a bit more balance and stability. As I said, others out there can't seem to display that. Selective hearing, that's what it seems to be, okay? So you can let me know your thoughts down below if you want, but what we can do now is focus on the comment section. And I said, I'm doing this as a dedicated video because there's two lots of comment sections and some of the comments are a bit longer than usual, right? And there might be more engagement. So I thought, let's just focus on this so it doesn't overshadow another video out there, okay? Let's head on right now and see what it's all about. I will just adjust it to the newest. Start from the bottom. Cleo say, good lesson today. Happy. Made half-time report as well. Anxious for upcoming projects. Thank you, Warlike Ref. Why are you anxious for upcoming projects? Is it stuff you're working on? Glenn. Shout out to Glenn. Shout out to Iceberg, of course. Smooth Fishing saying, I don't know what Justin Rounds knows, but he honestly thinks Don had something to do with Dylan's death. I agree with you about not thinking that the bikers or the biker club had anything to do with Dylan's death. Okay. Now, yeah, Justin has gone quiet since. He doesn't call out Don anymore. Is that because Justin has learnt to keep it quiet, but he still is suspicious? Or... Has something been cleared up in the background, I wonder. Will we ever know? Christy watching second half. Fell asleep. <laughs> okay. Mousetrap, you're welcome. Florida Hiker. Shout out to Florida Hiker. Um, I guess a new viewer in recent time. There was another person who I've never seen before. Angel333 three, 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 or Tree Tree Tree. Never seen them before, so I guess welcome to the channel. And I guess anybody else who's coming new, you know, and those in the background. Florida says, did Kurt Wadsworth and Don Hatley plan the hostage call in a bar? Yeah. So, Taylina, Kurt Wadsworth's daughter, is saying how 
Kurt Wadsworth did not do it as a tactic or a decoy. And that it's the ex-girlfriend of Kurt Wadsworth. Some psychic, okay? Maybe one of those delusional types that influenced Kurt Wadsworth about this supposed information. And because Kurt Wadsworth supposedly cares about Dylan, that's why Kurt alerted the police and the family. But as I said, whether it was intentional or not, other people out there could use it to their own advantage as a decoy. If the police presence, if family, are moved away from the scene of the crime and the suspect, the main one, is present, it gives them time to clean themselves up, to get the story clear, to meet up with maybe Don. Did that ever happen? I don't think so. Because look at spring cleaning, June 2nd. Why did Brenner leave it that late? Why didn't Brenner do spring cleaning on the 31st of May when Kurt Wadsworth made the call to the family police about Dylan supposedly held hostage in Montello, which did grab the attention of the authorities? Why didn't Brenner do spring cleaning then when it was clearer and there was less people around? That's why it's very weird in my opinion. Let me know your thoughts. We got sun. Ooh, long coming. Uh Uh-oh. So, Sun says, Warlight Ref, you're right. Candice Cooley said, no DNA was found in the shed. The hole is in the shed. Yes. Candice Cooley we saw in one of the later interviews by herself, I believe. And she was basically saying how there was forensics, there was room for opportunity, but it was done too late. So the DNA disappeared with time, right? Where... It weared away, if that's the best way of calling it. Yet, from the whole what we saw, some attempt was made, right, to maybe get DNA from the place. Warlight Ref, I googled McGraw Bar and Grill. It came up in Braunfels, Texas. So, son, in terms of the name of the bar, I think you may have got the wrong name, hence why it went to a different location. What I will do, son... When there is time, unfortunately, there isn't any time at this moment because of the Kenny Veach stuff, okay? That does need to be done soon. But when I do get time, I will do that bar review of the actual place where Don Hatley was and where the photo was taken, okay? And it will make it a lot clearer. So just be on the lookout for that in the future. Sun says in response, Dan, Dan Hatley. He looks like a biker to me. And maybe that was a spelling mistake. You mean Don? Black Levers, Harley, Bear Gut, McGrews is a biker's bar. McGrews. Let me just see. McGraw. Ah, McGraw, McGrews. Oh, well. Well, whether it was spelt right or wrong, there are different locations with the same name. So, as for reference, it'll all make sense when my video comes out. If anyone in Montello knows if Don Hatley runs with the Sundowners, leave a text, a message in the chat or in the comment section. If someone watching can identify what his tattoos say, let us know. Was Ed Harshberger a biker as well? One had to ask how they make their money to travel. It cost money to run to the Mexican border. There's a good reason Justin Rounds suspects Don Hatley. Right. So if anyone's got any answers regarding Don Hatley, a certain biker gang known as the Sun Downers, anything to do with Ed Harshberger being involved as well. If anyone's got information, feel free, if you can, share it down below in the comment section or respond back to Sun in her comment. Regarding the hole in the shed, we assumed the FBI dug it, but I now question that. I suspect Brenner filled those bags with blood-soaked earth. What else could it have been? We know he did not clean up the beer cans. The yellow tote and the death box is now missing, but maybe Dylan's parents or Kurt took those. If Ty Corbin is listening, could he enlighten us about Don Hatley's connection to a biker MC club? I mean... Um, Ty could enlighten people about the truth, but I think before he enlightens people, he'll probably have another dig at me with my titled videos and mention clickbait again, which is false information. Mm. 
Moving on. Sun says, Warlight Ref, remember early on a biker came in a chat with Black Dove on a panel, Ranger and others were on panel. I think it was on Salty Pancakes and Zav Girls live stream calling and he made a statement about bikers knowing what happened to Dylan. I remember people wanted the guy to get on panel but he couldn't. I could not understand why a biker would text what he said in the chat. Sorry, I don't remember his name. It had an H in the avatar. <coughs> so a default profile, right? Ask Shack Lady if she remembers the guy's avatar name. She took good notes. Maybe she can ask her buddy Kurt Wadsworth about Don Hatley's tattoos and connections to a biker MC club. Okay, so first of all, son... I don't remember a biker coming into a chat with Black Dove on panel, Ranger and others, because I wasn't around at the time there, if it was really early on. I joined the Dylan Rounds case community nearly a month later or so. Maybe it's not as split apart. No, it can't be. No, no. Because around the time of when I got involved in a case, Salty Pancakes popped up, so forget about that. But... What I will say is I wasn't around during Pancakes or Zav Girls live stream when all this happened, okay? I didn't see it, never heard of it before, okay? I've heard references of biker gangs being involved. If this is where it originated from, then it will make more sense as to why it brought it was brought up in conversation and remained for quite some time being talked about, okay? So yeah, never heard about it before until now. Anyone else in the chat, let me know. Have you witnessed this before? Did you see this in the past? Anyone in the chat? Let me know right now. Um, anything else? So some biker showed up claiming to know what happened to Dylan. How many times has that happened with other people out there claiming to know what's happened? A range of people. Do all those individuals that claim to know what's happened are actually from the area? Not always. And if they are, do they have proof? It's not often shown. So you can listen in. It shouldn't be dismissed, but just got to be careful when listening in. But maybe at the time back then, certain impressionable people and creators back then may have believed in it and got a bit excited by it. And that temptation and that teasing by the biker of, oh, I'll leave a text here, but I can't come on to panel. Maybe it would have drived a few people crazy back then, you know, really early on. And people thinking, whoa, this person supposedly has answers, but they're, they're not reaching out. See, this is the most important factor and measure point you can use within a case like this and other true crime stuff out there. If an individual shows up on YouTube or a social media platform claiming to have all the answers and information regarding the whereabouts of a missing person or how the person died, whatever. If a person comes up with sensitive information and they claim they know it all, why do they come to social media first? Why don't they prioritise telling the private family, the investigators, the police in the background first? That's more important, right? To be blurting it out on social media online, sensitive information could harm the case. Now, a person that likely would do that is someone that doesn't actually have real sensitive information. They've just made it up themselves just for a bit of attention and uh, the 15 minutes of fame, let's call it, right? Because if there are real people out there and they have real information, the normal thing to do is contact police, contact the family about it. And then maybe if you had the, the thumbs up to spread the message, then you would mention it online. But to prioritise telling people online who aren't even a part of the case about it seems a bit reckless and also probably lacking in truth, at least from how I've constructed it there, okay? So, yeah, anything else here? I don't remember the name. Ask Shack Lady. I uh, don't think that would go down too well, to be honest. That's the way Shack Lady has behaved in the past. Um, I think Shack Lady may return back to the Dylan Rounds case. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if it'll be good. Sun says, Warlike Ref, you identify as a gorilla. That's funny. I was thinking you identified more of a fine stud horse. Okay. 
But okay, a silverback is a pretty tough animal. And this is the thing, son. Yes, a horse may stand on five legs. Okay? I may lack in the department of size. But I'll tell you what I compensate for. Rough, hard, rugged, durable silverback nipples. Yeah. More durable than anything else out there. More durable than a Duracell battery. Stamina. Tension. Elasticity. All in the control here. So yeah. Whilst I may not measure up to a horse, I can at least make a horse sound. So I guess that's something. I could try a horse sound right now. But I do have a bit of a dry throat. So let me just wet my throat. I need to wet my mouth. There you go. No ASMR sounds. No, no, no. Put the ball over there. Okay. Let me try. I've not done it for a while. This might sound like more of a younger horse, to be honest. I'm not really an expert. You got the, you got the, the, and then when they rear up. There you go. As for a gorilla, how do you do a gorilla? There's a bit of panting, isn't there? And then if if you had like the King Kong bit as well with the kind of like the roar, providing I don't sound too much like a grizzly bear because sometimes it can sound like that. There we go. We'll leave it like that, just in case people think this is some kind of farmyard. We are focusing on Dylan Rounds. A couple of responses here. What's this all about? Oh yeah, Glasgow. So this is so basically this is from my point of view, Glasgow. On the comment section, I can see the links. I, I know some may have been removed by YouTube, typical. But when I did go on the desktop on the computer for the comment section, I couldn't see these links. But I can on mobile. Really weird, isn't it? But yeah. That's all to do with Kenny Veach and M Cave. Partially what I talked about earlier. So shout out to Glasgow Mac regarding that because we do need to look into that in a future video. So, we've gone through some of the comments here. Let's move on to the other comments section and focus there, maybe more so to do with Chase Venstra. Here we go. Just it's a new Maybe a few more comments this time round. Nevertheless, we've got Skeptical showing up. Ooh, long comment. Skeptical catching up with previous stuff. Warlight Raph, some of my comments here today may not have anything to do with this video in particular, the Chase Fenster one. I apologise, I'm catching up on the last few videos, no problem. Skeptical says, in regards to Brenner squatting on the shed property, I maintain, in my opinion, that everyone related to this case, family, friends, including the owner of the property, knew Brenner was living there. There is more information that people knew than there is they didn't. Right, let me just reread that. There is more information that people knew than there is they didn't. I don't quite understand that bit. Everyone related to the case. You're right, okay. So, first of all, let's start with the owner from what CL has rambled on about. So, for anyone watching right now who doesn't understand the abbreviation, okay? JB means James Brenner. D-H means Don Hatley, K-W means Kurt Wadsworth, um, C-L means Corey LeBur, however you say her last name, okay, Corey, you know, the person with the blonde hair in the past that had a lot of information on the Dylan Rounds case, Corey originated from Pancake's community and then was kicked off there because they didn't believe her and the audience didn't. Then she bounced about and then Corey came here. And then since has bounced about on Bob Farrell's Twin Mamas community, Corey. And on top of that, some of Pancake's ex-viewers that didn't trust her in the first place trust her now. So you see how allegiances change all over the place like a pair of clothes and hot meals over and over again, right? But here's what it is. So CL means Corey. So that's how I'll refer to the person here. 
so skeptical says from what Corey has rambled on about if it is really Corey. So just for reference, skeptical, at some point when Corey, the real Corey, was on my channel, as you've seen, before that, the fake impersonation Corey was present as well. The problem is it was very hard to differentiate because what was being talked about from both individuals seemed to be in consistency with, you know, talking about the case and what they knew of. Normally, when you get an impersonation account, they slip up and they talk about completely random stuff and are negative. But when I came across Corey here, the real one and the fake one, they were basically talking about the same stuff. So <laughs> some people in the background would suggest, oh, same person then, there was never a fake one, right? Things like that. But it is what it is. Skeptical says, with Corey, it would seem JS must have known but never took the steps to evict Brenner from the property. Right, so JS. Some of you may wonder, who is JS? That means John Sheldon. Okay, some of you may have heard the name John Sheldon. Okay, so uh, must have known but never took the steps to evict Brenner from the property of the grain shed, supposedly squatting. Each state has their own squatter laws in which Brenner could have filed for rights to the property after a set number of years. In my state, it's five. Perhaps Brenner didn't file this claim because he had permission to be there. I cannot imagine Dylan would have never mentioned Brenner living there to John Sheldon, the owner, since it seems Dylan and John Sheldon were very good friends. Okay, I imagine Sheldon knew how important it was for Dylan to have Brenner nearby as a worker and to watch over the shared property. Fair points. Now, Corey in the background stated that we never allowed Brenner to be there on site, but deals were made in the background by Kurt Wadsworth, Don Hatley, I think, and Brenner. So the, the words around it. Okay, well, not much resistance in the end, was there? Like our sceptical mentions. Don Hatley definitely knew. Kurt Wadsworth definitely knew. I guess that ties in with what Corey's saying then. And now for the family. I maintain they all knew and looked the other way. Right, the information that has been provided is Brenner also lived on Candice Cooley's property at one point. Justin Rounds knew of Brenner from the death threat he overheard, and now we find out Dylan bought Brenner a trailer to live on the property. How is that not giving someone permission? I can't imagine Dylan kept this a secret from all those people. That's a fair point as well. Maybe Justin Rounds, Candice Cooley, to an extent, whether they knew or not, may have not cared that much if Brenner was squatting on that land because it wasn't theirs and they weren't, they weren't living in that state, so it wasn't any of their business. And as we've seen, due to the cool, calm nature of, yeah, Justin Rounds received a death threat from Brenner, but never mind, we'll still allow Dylan around Brenner afterwards with not much resistance or little to resistance. Yeah, I think there's different ways of looking around it, but I do understand what Skeptical is getting at here. Was there anything else I needed to point out, though? Um, yeah, so the bit about Brenner in the past living on Candice Cooley's property at one point. It was like in the back garden, but further back. And it was at a time when Brenner and Dylan were kind of living in closer proximity with one another. Because at the time, they were doing custom farm work elsewhere in Idaho. Hence why living at Candice Cooley's former property in their own trailer or trailers at the time, okay? So it was interesting that because it, it made me think that even in the past when Dylan was so close to Brenner in proximity and working together back then, did Brenner ever attempt to kill Dylan then? No. But it happened on the 28th of May, years later, 2022. So it would create more of a snap moment. If Brenner had opportunities in the past or he was just closer to Dylan in the past to generate more frustration and disagreements, you know, 
Brenner doesn't like being spoken to in certain ways. Brenner can get easily triggered and can easily snap. Yet if it was for a few months where Brenner had to work alongside Dylan and closely in proximity too, and yet they didn't have any bad altercations, Brenner was able to put up with Dylan then. So why did Brenner snap? Why did Brenner lose it on Dylan after Dylan being away from the grain shed property and his farm for over six weeks because Dylan was individually doing custom farm work elsewhere? So Brenner, in a way, had peace and quiet at the grain shed property. So it just goes to show that, yeah, you can be around someone for a long time. Maybe nothing bad happens. But then fast forward onwards, when you're not around the person as much, and then you do become in the presence of them, then they can snap at you. And it does highlight more of a snap than anything else, at least in my opinion. There can still be grudges and there can still be frustration from the past as a, a motivating factor. But at that moment, at that time, something must have happened to trigger Brenner on the 28th. That's what I would say. Okay. So yeah. Moving on. Skeptical says, no one should be hiding behind the word squatter to distance themselves from knowing. If you don't want someone on a property, take the steps to remove them. Don't buy them a trailer to live in. Fair point. It's like Dylan Rounds was inviting Brenner. Now, let's just be very clear. One is not saying that Dylan was asking for it, asking to be killed by Brenner. But I think the best way of putting it is Dylan Rounds was too casual and a bit too naive, okay, when around Brenner. You can say, well, because of the age factor. So there's that to put in play. Dylan Rounds hanging around much older males just because of who was around at the time in that area. It is what it is. But with Dylan Rounds in the past when he heard Brenner threaten to kill his own dad, Justin Rounds, and Dylan told Justin Rounds, and Justin Rounds responded and Dylan said, oh, it's okay, he's just an ass, you know, pain in the backside, that's all, doesn't mean much harm. Look what it led to in the end. So there is naivety with Dylan Rounds, but it would be understood through his younger age. So there is that as a factor to take in mind. Now, Skeptical says, to play the devil's advocate, I'll concede that Dylan may have kept this information secret from the family and owner on a Facebook post, Justin Rounds referred to Dylan and his brother keeping secrets, Colton Rounds, yes. Now, that was more to do with in a funny way, but we did branch on past that saying, well, what else could one be hiding secrets about? So let's just clear that up or elaborate there. So I covered it on my channel in the past where Justin Rounds was sharing memories of the past of Dylan Rounds. Like Dylan Rounds in the past used to kind of break stuff, maybe farming equipment, accidental, maybe a bit clumsy, reckless, and that Dylan wouldn't say anything, Colton Rounds would know or be told by Dylan and would keep it a secret. And that's how they worked. They got on well, they kept each other's secrets. So what else was secret? What else did Dylan Rounds tell Colton at some point? You know? Now, Colton hasn't come forwards and it's not been quoted from him since about anything. So maybe there's nothing there, but there's always that what if. So I understand that. The one thing that Dylan Rounds lied about directly to the mother, Candice Cooley, was to do around the 25th of May, bordering onwards, 25th, 26th, when Dylan Rounds picked up Chase Venstra on the side of the road and took him to Montello. Now, when Dylan told Candice Cooley, the mother, about it, Dylan said, oh, I just drove past, I didn't pick him up. That's a lie. Candice Cooley realised in the end when it was too late. But Candice Cooley understood why Dylan would lie to her is because, as Candice Cooley said, she would chew his ass. In which, to be honest, if you heard that reference, you might get a few looks and think, oh, who's in line there? Who's behind me? It's not quite like that. I think it's metaphorically speaking. I think chew your ass doesn't mean eat it, doesn't mean stick your tongue up someone's hole, it means have a go at somebody, call them out, tell them off. How could you do that? Dylan, why would you pick that person up? That's reckless, that's dangerous. Dylan Rounds didn't want to hear that commotion, so he lied to his mother. Kind of like many other situations in life with people, it's understandable, it's natural human behaviour. Trying to reduce the negatives um, and maximise peace at times. So yeah, 
So Dylan has lied here and there, just to prevent arguments from escalating. But Dylan Rounds was honest when telling his father, Justin, in the past about Brenner threatening to kill him. So there is that. There's some honesty here. This is the odd lie over there. Does it tie in with the Dylan Rounds case? Was there any other potential lies? You never know. Anyway, with that said, I still maintain Brenner was not squatting. He had permission to be there, whether directly or indirectly, by the actions or inactions of those around Dylan. Okay. Responses. Oh, Corey does show up. Interesting. Now, Weezer, key individual, local, saying, I agree. I agree with Skeptical. It was no secret that he was living there. Throughout this case, I have heard tons of references about squatters in this area. These people are not squatters. They own the property they're on and have opted to live off grid. As for Brenner, I was under the assumption he was caretaking the property. Now, Corey shows up, as you can see here, supposedly the real Corey. Says, I will try and explain. We were not told for several months Brenner was there. That was Ed Harshberger and Don Hatley doing because Kurt wanted Brenner out of town. Right. Due, due to his anger, fighting and drinking. But as time passed, Dylan needed someone to help him do a few odd jobs as Don Hatley was not helping much and Ed Harshberger was in jail for stealing certified seed no longer at the shed property. Ed H. is a tall, thin man, totally a cowboy type, big belt buckle, jeans, cowboy boots and hat. He did not respect women in the least. When he was taught to by a woman, he was rude in general. He was a part-time real estate underwriter and a con, not a biker. He lived on the property in his motorhome. As far as I know, he now lives in... AR? Is that Arizona? I don't know. Or with someone or out of his rig and uses public truck stops. Unless he has con. Has con. Con someone into something? He has nothing. Never did. Never has. We then found out Brenner was there. Dylan had work hours to pay Brenner and Brenner asked Dylan to buy a camper for him in of wages owed by him. Brenner should never set it up at the shed. He did that on his own. So basically, no. Brenner did not have permission to set up his camper and was told it was only temporary. And he had planned to move to town or out of state. That never happened. And I'll say again, there was no room to back the grain truck in the shed. Absolutely no room. Justin pulled it forwards away from the opening. It was not inside the shed, only backed up in front of. And last we knew, there was rebar in front of the shed, not a lot. Most of the rebar was off to the side and it was there to set down to pour concrete. But Ed H never finished the job nor finished setting up camper slaps or hookups he took off. So with that all in mind, let's say... Well, at the time of June 2nd spring cleaning where Candice Cooley just in rounds, Candice Cooley on site with police saying she witnessed Brenner get in the grain truck and drive it out from the shed. Are you saying, Corey, that you were there to see it actually for your own eyes to say that wasn't the case and that the truck was already out? Were you there yourself? Interesting. Hmm. As well, Dylan never drove the grain truck to the shed. On Saturday morning, never happened because he did not need to. He had a tarp to cover the G truck and not all that much seed left, only 30 acres of seed or less, and the rest of the 120 had and was planted. The total, total acres were planned with about 150 and only out about 600 as far as the pivotal system would reach. Planted on late afternoon evening after he returned from Murtor. Idaho, Dylan tried calling John S, John Sheldon, for around three to four, whatever, in time difference, then headed back to his farm. It takes about an hour and a half, give or take, depending on speed or main road or back road from Idaho border. Note, Dylan always had his handgun and key fob and billfold with him. 
no matter what rig he was, on truck, tractor, pickup, camper, etc. And that tells us exactly where he was because those items were in the camper and it was where they were at when Dylan was jumped or kidnapped. So Corey says Dylan was jumped or kidnapped at his trailer in the morning time. Now, if that was really the case, Corey, how come those campers people hiking out there, witnessing, overlooking Dylan's farm in the morning time, slept overnight there, and in the morning time they did not report or see anything like that happening early on in the day. Hmm, anyway. The grain truck was moved and drove over to the shed on Sunday by Brenner when he and Don went to look for Dylan when Karen Rounds called Don H and asked him to go check that was late in the afternoon Sunday, Don Hatley and his son Brenner together because Don H picked up Brenner at the shed because Jim's rig was not working, overheating all the time and would not stop when it heated up. Kurt Wadsworth asked Don H about details of that and Don confirmed Brenner decided to take drive the grain truck over to the shed on Sunday because he may have felt he was either helping or possibly could use it for a while and that's how it got to the shed on Sunday. Sound f cell phone pings were on Saturday and MHO info from Tracy is about Chase and Robert had Dylan in Robert's car and the cell phone was in their possession. I also believe that phone was later given to Ty Corbin by Robert just before he was taken out to Lucent Pond. The SNR team had already searched the area around the pond before Ty Corbin followed the law out there. As well, there was a second phone, an old phone of Dylan's that was synced paired with his new phone totally downloaded and activated message call videos photos activated and synced together the cell phone at loose and pond was not in the water it was on the side of the bank not in it was dry and not wet the garbage cleaned up was basically beer cans and household trash in the shed because that is where Brenner was dumping garbage as well in to use it out house his camper was not hooked up to water or sewage because it was supposed temporary camping Anyone can have theories, you all have that ability, and any put is looked at, such as it is. We shall never know all, most likely. Right, so Corey states she knows it all, knows that Brenner isn't directly responsible, but Chase Fenstra Aviles is, and Ty Corbin plays a role, and that the spring cleaning had nothing to do with getting rid of evidence, yet Brenner took it upon himself to do it at the time of a crime scene, which is very odd in itself. That Corey seems to downplay the time lapse of Brenner with blood on him cleaning a gun and DNA on the shirt of Brenner, which was later found by police. That's downplayed, like it doesn't mean anything at all. And all the whilst Corey says all this and also claims that she might be appearing in court during the Brenner case, the Dylan Rounds case, at the end of this paragraph she says, We shall never know all. So you claim to know it all, and then you say, we may never know the whole truth. Well, you've contradicted yourself, Corey. See, this is the problem, Corey. You've added details on now, which you didn't before. So each time the story changes or it, it goes down a different route or direction. So it's hard to keep up with you, okay? So from an outsider's perspective, not me, not me. Some of a stranger out there could say, this person seems to know a lot and talks a lot publicly, right? Were they actually there at the time, physically, yes or no? Are they trying to cause misdirection because they're involved themselves in the case? That's how some people can look at it. Am I? I'm just simply reading, that's all. Of course, if what Corey says here can be backed up, by the family, okay, fair enough, fair enough. By police, fair enough. By court documents, fair enough. But none of that has been proven. Simple as, right? Corey supposedly has been told about certain stuff by Justin, or that Justin already knows things mentioned such as her. But I said, I've never seen Justin Rounds or Candice Cooley back up Corey. It's Corey doing all the talking and no one else backing her up, besides the odd outsider on YouTube. That's what the problem is, right? There's not enough consistency. There's not enough individual 
individual consensus. I don't see enough evidence, it's just words, right? Now, of course, there's people within the case that have stated things and it's just based on words and having to believe in them. But normally, and in a normal situation, that's what you would have to have your trust in. And then later, it could be proven through the court documents. So I do think there's a few contradictions here, and there have been contradictions in the past by Corey. But then other times, because I've questioned her, but for the right reason, she's got a li just a tiny, tiny little bit defensive. But, you know, we've read her comment out. It remains public, in case anyone's wondering. Now, Skeptical says, Raf, I reported the comment by Corey as misinformation. I wasn't aware that doing that would remove the comment from seeing it, but I'm glad it did. So Skeptical, as a heads up, Corey's comment is still publicly visible on screen, okay? The only way her comment would be removed if I outright deleted it, okay? or if YouTube deleted it themselves. What tends to happen, Skeptical, you can report a comment and then it disappears after. Sometimes if you refresh the screen, it will show up once again. YouTube will take a look at the reported content, and then if it does break guidelines, they will then take action. But as we know, YouTube are incompetent and as useless as a bag of crisp, which have gone flat, okay? Can they go flat? Well, they can be if you sit on them. So, yeah. Now, I'm not going to delete Corey's comment, okay? Because that will break freedom of speech in a way, but it will also cause so much unnecessary backlash, okay? But whenever I do read out Corey's comments, I will say, as a disclaimer, before or after... Feel free to listen in to what she's got to say, but be very careful because we've seen how it's gone within the case with time, okay? I said, my opinion always is, if someone knows a lot and it goes completely against the original narrative, why are they spending their time here talking about it publicly when if it is truly the truth, shouldn't it be used directly in the case? Now, if Justin Rounds, Candice Cooley rejected what Corey had to say, that would be more understandable. That would be more genuine. Because a good example of a genuine individual that tried helping within the case, who heard about things going on and may have witnessed the odd thing here and there in the background, would be Weezer. Such as with the Dewey truck early on at the time, with who she knows and people in the area reaching out to her. All Weezer did was simply reach out to Candice Cooley about it, okay? And even the police, I believe. And they rejected her. They didn't want to listen. A genuine attempt was made as a potential lead and linking to the Dylan Brown's case, and it was turned down. That's very unfortunate and a great shame. But an attempt was made, a form of effort and care by Weezer. That's genuine. Weezer in the early days, didn't just jump onto YouTube immediately and said, did anyone hear about the Dewey truck? Yeah, this happened. And the Dewey truck picked up Dylan Rounds and took him elsewhere and then disposed of him. Now, none of that happened. Weezer said from what she knows, from what she's witnessed, and at the right time. But before telling general public, she tried reaching out to such as the family. And it didn't work out. What more can you do past that point? Well, I guess there's no harm in talking about it publicly, at least. So somebody knows about it. That's the appropriate way around it. Anyway, let's just refer back to Skeptical, okay? Skeptical says, viewers, especially new viewers to this channel, follow the facts. Follow what has been reported by L.E. and Dylan's family to be the truth. The grey areas in between the reported facts and where theories and speculation can be disclosed, but never have these discussions been stated as facts, nor should they be. There is evidence and reports to support Dylan was at the Shed property Saturday morning. Yes, with the phone call, with Karen Rounds herself being on the receiving end of Dylan calling her. That's how the story has been told. That's how the family said it and how the actual receiver said it. And yet people who are not even from the area, the odd person up above, is saying it never did happen. 
But were they there to see it? Were they on the receiving end of the call by Dylan at the time? No, Karen Rounds was. She's recalling what happened and what Dylan said. So it is where it is. So I understand what sceptical is referring to here. Um, there are confirmed reports by Ellie. His phone was found at the bottom of Lucent Pond. What doesn't exist is a report that anyone told Ellie they drove Dylan's truck to the shared property on Sunday or that he was kidnapped. True. It's never been told, the story. Now, if Corey or other people in the background wanted to say, well, those within within the case are keeping quiet about it or they don't want to choose to believe or listen in that, well, why not just simply reach out to the police and the official people? If you know more, contact the right people then instead of being here. And as for the way the story's gone, the police hasn't made any corrections or adjustments or included anything in the report or such that nature, they're stuck with the original story and it's not changed since. So is that not good enough? Hmm. Anyway, Skeptical says, if you are new to this case of Dylan Rounds and that goes for anybody out there, please do your own research. We are not here trying to sway opinions one way or another or away from the facts and evidence. I'd like to clarify that my opinion that people knew Brenner, people knew he was there and people knew that he was capable of all comes from reported statements. I just read an article that stated when Don Hatley was interviewed by LE for the second time, he told them he knew Brenner shouldn't have had firearms based on his criminal history, yet he let this dangerous person interact with Dylan. Raf, I watch, I'm subscribed and support your channel because your analysis of this case genuinely is about the facts and balance. If you feel strongly about something happening a certain way, you are careful to say this is my opinion or this is my theory. True. Thank you for not being tied up in rumours and statements that aren't supported. In fact, you're welcome. Appreciate what Skeptical says there for kind words. And yeah, just in general, anybody watching right now and knows in the background, you come across someone that has a lot of information to share, feel free to listen in but don't get brainwashed, okay? Still have your own ideas. As said, if people are so triggered by those not believing in them who have the alternative truth, well, just be patient. And if it is mentioned in court documents officially, then fair enough, fair enough. But it's just not been backed up enough. It's not been reinforced enough. Now, I've got extensive experience there because Corey and other people out there, okay, what you need to understand, you may think I'm stubborn or awkward at times, yes, but there's a reason, that there needs to be more consistency, that there needs to be more people, that there needs to be some kind of evidence material and attempt effort made to convey a certain message, point or claim besides text-based conversation, right? It can be on one's own YouTube channel, a photo, a video, a text message, whatever, proof like that. If it can't be shared because of private reasons, sensitive matters, then the original point that was mentioned by you shouldn't be in the first place. Kind of contradict yourself there if that was the case. Now, when it comes to the Kenny Veach case, me, Warlight Ref, I have mentioned groundbreaking ideas, concepts, suggesting Kenny Veach could still be alive or was alive up to the point of 2018 right? If I just stated it like that on a channel or somewhere saying, Kenny Veach is alive, the end. Kenny Veach was seen here, the end. Who would believe me? I wouldn't expect anyone to believe me. But what I've done with time, evidence, material, has come along the way which could be used to reinforce that original point. 2018 CCTV footage break-in of a Reiki healing store in Chanted Forest in Las Vegas, Nevada. And the person that owns and runs the store is Debbie Veach, the sister of Kenny Veach. And the brother of Kenny Veach, Raymond Veach, does classes there as well. Isn't that such a coincidence? And the person on CCTV nighttime break-in looks like Kenny Veach. Did I say it's 100% for sure for definite Kenny Veach? Not quite in the original video. I said it looks like. It suggests he's alive. And with the evidence along the way, on top of that, because it wasn't just one thing, it was a second piece. A phone call made, missed call, by Susan Veach's sister-in-law to Kenny Veach, in which Kenny attempted to make a call to Susan, but Susan wasn't around at the time to answer it. Very odd. 2022. 
multiple pieces of evidence, more evidence there to reinforce the original point in theory that Kenny Beach could still be alive till this day, okay? I'm not even from the US, but with time, was able to get a hold of bits and bobs of key material with time and credit to the individuals that reached out. That's how you go about things. You can mention a point, you can mention a theory, you could even mention a fact or an event, but it can't be backed up enough or reinforced enough. And on top of that, maybe there's not a consensus of individual people out there with independent thoughts coming to the same conclusion and knowledge. If that's lacking, then really, it's just a suggestion, it's a theory, an idea. Not even backed up by Justin Rounds, as one would claim. Not even backed up by Candice Cooley. Not even backed up by current court documents. Not even backed up by the police. So what have we got to fall back on? Not much. And, you know, what Corey says, yes, in great depth, in great depth, length, detail. The same thing happened in the Kenny Veach case with Gene Lakovsky, claiming to be this and that and giving a lot of information, a lot of research, a lot of dates, a lot of key timestamps and years. Very interesting. How much of it was really true, though? Because that person was later exposed as a supposed fake. So it, it can get deep. It can get deep. This could be an example of going on a wild goose chase. Because, yeah, it could be interesting to investigate and do map analysis of all these other alternative events, but it feels like I'm, I, I would be drifting away from the case. And it might come cause more harm than worth. If there was some evidence along the way to suggest what Corey is saying, new groundbreaking evidence or news reports, if it could be backed up by an official person somewhere, I would I would give some attention and focus and do an analysis, but that's lacking at the moment, which is unfortunate. But, you know, as your person in the background wants to complain, saying, oh, being very selective here. No, because I have looked at these comments in the past as well and read them out to people. People can choose to believe in it or not, but it's always worth being aware just to be careful on top of it all. So that seems to be it there. Did we answer everything? I believe we did. Yep. Weezer says, I really wish I could watch today, but I have to work. I will have to watch it later. My work schedule is interfering with your schedule, but I try to pop in when I can. That's understandable. We got Ron as well. Ronald Cully, Ron, you know, is also mentioned about Montello. There can be a few rough and rugged people about and bad things going on with time. Ron has also mentioned that others out there within the YouTube streets have been supposedly treating him very badly and all kinds of wacky stuff going on in the background. Who knows that? If you want to elaborate, feel free to do so. Skeptical, is there any responses here? No, there isn't. That's a bit of a miracle. Skeptical says, in regards to the phone recording time lapse, I do understand your thinking behind what the true evidence shows. However, it would also be helpful to know if the recording started with Brenner cleaning the gun. Did it appear the video was started and the cleaning began? Or did the preserved video look as though there may have been more recorded prior to the starting point? Fair point there. As described by Justin Rounds, Candice Cooley, they didn't mention any other details. So maybe it is only to do with cleaning the gun. But yeah, it does make you think that as soon as the start button was hit, accidentally touched, did it show Brenner stepping back from the phone? Did it show him at a distance? Because if he was at a distance when the video started, who started it then, right? So the closer Brenner is in proximity to the phone upon the video starting would mean he accidentally pressed it or pressed it on purpose. That's what I'd say. If Brenner was at a great distance and the video started and was stopped, well, that would imply somebody else was present at the time. So yeah, it's kind of like when you see me do my videos, at times I hit the start button I take a breath and then I start speaking and then I edit it out afterwards, okay? But sometimes I time it where I hit the start button, I'm at distance, arm distance, so my hand, my finger can reach the screen, but my actual body and head is sat back, right, in proportion. I press the start button, I move my arm away quick, quick enough before the video starts and I say, hi, welcome to the video. For example, this video today as for the intro so you wouldn't really know but if I was across the room next to the door and I hit I wouldn't have it would have been perceived by people as I couldn't have hit the start button if I'm at the door because my arms wouldn't reach that far but to be honest 
in an edited video, it would be possible. You'd hit the start button, you'd run over to the door, do your talking, come back, hit stop button, and then go into the editor, cut out the first part, and then it, the video would start as if you're further away, right? So you can deceive people like that, like an illusion, but when it comes to Brenner, we're talking about time-lapse footage, which was unedited. So Brenner must have been close nearby to the phone for the video to start. Maybe, maybe the time-lapse footage started in total darkness if it was in Brenner's pocket or hand. You couldn't see much. And then it was dropped. And then it showed Brenner moving away, sitting down or standing up, then cleaning himself up. So how the phone landed was by luck and a miracle. And the accident of recording it by Brenner was down to clumsiness. And it just so happened to all fall in place with one another. But it's, it's a key point what Skeptical mentions about the starting point. What did it depict from the beginning? Skeptical says, here's why I bring this up. And if I may offer my own thoughts, Dylan backs into the horse gate, the grain shed. Brenner comes out the trailer to confront Dylan, gun in hand, possibly. There's an argument. Dylan starts recording the situation. Brenner shoots Dylan, takes the phone into the trailer and doesn't stop the recording right away. Now, one of two things may have happened. One, Brenner may have tried deleting the video, knowing the shooting was recorded, but failed to delete all of it. Whilst in the pond water, most of the video was corrupted, but as we all feel, thankfully, some of it was left. Okay, fair point, fair point. I mean, family said when they uh, duplicated Dylan's phone or something, cloned it, they found nothing on it. Nothing. It took a forensic team to locate that key footage. So it must have been deleted from the phone by Brenner or someone, or just simply destroyed through the pond. Then it was later recovered. Okay? But there was never any mention about a corrupted file or having to break it or any mentions of there was some corrupted footage, but we did see this depicted in on the phone. So there was no mention of that. I guess it depends on the quality of a video as well. I mean, have I had corrupted files? Yeah, and that wasn't through deleting it. It was through malfunctions or glitches or bugs. Did it corrupt the whole file? I believe it did, if it was a singular video. There's been other times where you can play back the video, but you can't upload it because it's of a corrupted file, but you can simply watch it back, which it doesn't quite make sense. And it's all there. So maybe there's a bit of give and take. But I don't know, you would have thought just in rounds, Candice Cooley would have mentioned more. And that if there was a possibility of Dylan hitting the record button and it was outside, could there be any chance whatsoever that part of it was shown? I mean, if it, if it wasn't corrupted at all and it started from Dylan hitting the record button, then you'd think, well, Brenner would have been locked up long time by now and much earlier on, November 14th, instead of March 3rd being charged. It would have been much earlier in 22, not 23, because it would have shown Brenner holding a gun towards Dylan. That would have been more than enough as incriminating evidence, but none of that seemed to occur. The only thing what we have seen is the after footage. Okay, and some people can be awkward enough out there to say, well, it, there's no actual footage of Brenner killing Dylan. But what we do have is the footage after it was done, and it just happens Brenner was covered in blood, right? Well, isn't that a coincidence, isn't it? Just after someone's been killed. Hmm. Anyway, now... One of two things may have happened. One, Brenner may have tried deleting the video knowing the shooting was recorded but failed. Oh yeah, corrupted. Yeah. The description of a time-lapse video first reported by either LE directly or misinterpreted by the news that reported it had always bothered me. We all know what a time-lapse video is. A series of photos put together in rapid concession. Someone had to purposely done that. Looking forward to hearing other thoughts on the cell phone recording video i would recommended viewers watching your videos on this your thoughts okay on to the next spring cleaning moment where this case could have had more evidence right so if the true definition of a time lapse video is a collection of photos taken then basically processed into a video format at the end of the day it's a video a time lapse video is a video 
maybe the process of taking multiple photos then piecing it into a video timeline creating it as an actual video it's a video at the end of the day that's the final product so what was found was the final product which was a video right now if you're doing a time lapse you can manually take a photo every day of yourself you look on youtube people aged from 10 to 64 years old 15 to 40 years old they take a photo every single day and then what they've done every single photo and it could be thousands of photos by the end of it have been put into a timeline video editor photo after photo after photo day after day after day they've sped it up times two times five so it's like a slideshow of photos processed into a video format in which you can play it back as a video. A slideshow is a collection of photos, as you would know, but it's in the process of a video because you hit the play button and it transitions from photo to photo. Okay, A time lapse is over a long period of time, but sped up to make the process and changes look more quicker and stand out more. So like a plant, evaporation, the growth within it changes made if you looked at it one day then 10 days later you looked back at it you would notice a change but you've not seen the steady growth with time it's like with stick man animation pivot animation where you could move an arm or a leg of a character a puppet whatever next frame you click then you do another movement the slower the movement, the less excessive, the more smooth it is. More frames, more time spent, but more of a flow to it. Just like animation out there, how it takes them years to create, right? Kind of like a time lapse in a way. Now, an actual time lapse video on iPhone, because I've done it myself extensively, and there's proof of it on my channel with some videos here and there of the sky. A time-lapse option on iPhone allows you to hit the start button. It actually records as a video. And then later, once you hit the stop button, it processes it and basically puts it on times 10 speed or something. So it plays the video back at a faster rate and it shows the growth or the change of something. So you've got the difference of a manual time-lapse of actually taking photos and then converting it into a video afterwards because it's the only way to do it to show that transition and process. Or you've got the automatic time lapse option, which you do get on mobile devices, where it records it for you, then processes it, and then speeds it up afterwards. Okay? That's how it works. The more still and the more steady something is, the better the growth, the smoother the frames. I tested it once, okay? You look at the sky, you may, not mo you may not notice much movement, but you will do after a time lapse has been processed. I did it in a moving vehicle in the past, but because one was already moving fast, it meant the time lapse was even faster, so it didn't look, it didn't look as right. So the slower, the better, okay? Now, Moving on. Cleo, there we go. Skeptical saying, currently watching your spring cleaning video. Warlight ref, the truck was put in the shed by Dylan or Brenner. To change my earlier theory, Brenner didn't come out with a gun but went back inside. Then after an argument, and at that point Dylan properly backs in the truck, which was his only concern that morning, Brenner comes back out with the gun. Hold on, was it reported to be Dylan's gun on the time-lapse video since Dylan's gun was returned clean to Dylan's trailer? Your theory of Brenner backing in the truck after killing Dylan to hide evidence makes sense too. Not that he cared about the seed. Yeah, yeah, to cover it up. It's, I mean, it's happened in the past, like... <laughs> Not to do with a crime, but let's say there was a stain in the carpet. You spilt something on the carpet, okay? What are you going to do? You might get told off by a family member or if you visited a friend or some of it, like a boss, for whatever reason, you might cover that stain up by putting a table over, over it or covering it up with a bit of paper or 
a mat, whatever's present, you cover something up. Or let's say you've got um, a coffee mug, you put it on the side of some wood, a table, tabletop, you pick it back up, it leaves a circular stain. So what you do, you get a coffee mat, you put it on, you get a statue and ornament, you cover it up so no one can see it at the time. Kind of like Brenner, possibly. Um, the bit about the time-lapse footage and Brenner cleaning a firearm, was it confirmed to be Dylan's? We've never heard that. But I did originally suggest that, with what was said by Candice Cooley, the gun later found retrieved at Dylan's trailer put back, but it was cleaned down, no evidence, no fingerprints. The alternative story by Corey, Bob Farrell, and some other people out there, as you know, was suggesting, well, no, claiming that it was Dylan's friend and uh, Dylan's brother Colton that took the items away, went to the grandparents, uh, Larry Rounds. Larry may have told him off and said, need to return it back. Larry did it himself, but also cleaned the items down so there was no evidence tracing back to the family so they wouldn't get in trouble. That's the alternative story. Yet Justin Rounds nor Candice Cooley has ever mentioned that nor agree with it because surely they would have mentioned it by now. And as well, Justin Rounds outright said at the beginning that the family, the parents, got there before Dylan's brother and Dylan's friend. And that the brother and friend found the gun and key fob when arriving there and said, oh, look, look, look what's been found. Look what's there. But the family, the parents, previously looked and it wasn't. That's what Justin Brown said himself, despite the outsiders claiming that Justin agrees with the outsiders. But Justin hasn't, because he's never said it public. So it's messy. So to return back to the original story, the original story, my original point was, well, if you got time-lapse footage of Brenner cleaning a firearm, cleaning it down, why? People clean firearms for numerous reasons. If it's been used excessively, you need to clean the barrel out. Depending what firearm it is, it might clog up. You want it to work, you want it to be functional. You might just clean it up for the appearance or to preserve the performance of a firearm. Okay, I don't own one, probably never will. But with common sense, that's what would happen and that's what people do with them. They like to look after their firearms. So it looks nice and it performs good. But... If it's not been used that often, okay, and it may have only been used once, you may clean it down if it's been used for bad actions, such as murder or hurting someone, wounding. So like with Brenner, maybe that was the case. And it just so happens that Dylan Round's firearm was missing at some point. Maybe in that time-lapse footage, Brenner was in possession of it, let's just say. Counterpoint, surely you would think Justin Rounds or Candice Cooley would say, hey, that's Dylan's firearm. But how often, as a counter-counterpoint, how often are the parents and family around Dylan long enough to know what firearm Dylan has? My alternative question would be, how often does Dylan Rounds change his firearms about, okay? Is it a long-lasting firearm, a handgun, a revolver, a pistol? How long has Dylan had it for? Was it around the time of when family knew of what firearm he had and what firearm he stuck with or the type of brand it would be, just like the boots? If the family were quickly and able to identify the boots behind the dirt mound as being Dylan's because Dylan stuck to a certain pair and that's all he ever did, if that applied to firearms as well, a trusted, reliable, sturdy firearm or a certain make or brand of firearm, then surely the family would equally be able to identify it being in the time-lapse footage which Brenner was in possession of. So there's two points to that. One, either Brenner, let's just say, on the basis that that firearm was used in the murder of Dylan Rounds on that basis, that Brenner was simply cleaning the firearm down to get rid of any evidence which could trace back to him. Now, as we know, the shirt he was wearing at the time was later retrieved, so that was a bit sloppy by Brenner. But on the day of the 28th, when Brenner felt like he had all the time in the world, he was focusing on one thing at a time, the disposing of Dylan, and maybe the cleaning of the murder weapon, as we saw in the time lapse. And then what happened to it? Who knows? Ty Corbin in the background said, Brenner has a chrome pistol, never found, missing. 
Could that be the murder weapon what you saw in the time-lapse footage? Why did no one or could anyone identify it in the time-lapse as being the chrome pistol? If so, you could link one thing with another to the death of Dylan Rounds. Now, if it was a completely different firearm, was the theory of, oh, maybe that was handed over to Don Hatley as part of the other firearms because Brenner didn't want to be in possession of them? No, because it would still fall back on Brenner eventually as we saw with Don Hatley surrendering them in. Police didn't catch wind of any of those firearms being used in Dylan's death. They were unrelated charges, so maybe there's no link there. So it would revert back to the original point that if a firearm was used, it was disposed of, and it's never been found since. Now, the other alternative theory, counterpoint to that, would be Dylan's firearm was used against him. But then that would mean that Brenner would have to be in the presence of Dylan with the firearm, Dylan being in possession of the firearm at the time, or Brenner went down to Dylan's place to get the firearm and then take Dylan out. But in terms of the timing of it all, just wouldn't be possible because by the time Brenner left the property, if Dylan just got there to go down to Dylan's farm to get the firearm, it, it wouldn't make much sense. But there was claims by Candice Cooley, despite what Corey says about Dylan being in possession of the firearm 24-7 or so, Candice Cooley said Dylan would have the firearm in his truck now, Dylan's truck would be at the farm if Dylan was in the grain truck, Dylan's pickup truck where the firearm is. It would still mean Brenner would have to go on down to the farm to get it to, the, to then go back to the grain shed property. By then, Dylan would have come and gone because he was only there to park the grain truck in the grain shed or at least attempt to, right? So they probably would have passed each other. It, it probably wouldn't have worked. So if it really was Dylan's firearm in that time-lapse footage, it would make me believe that Dylan would have had to be in possession of the firearm on the site of the grain shed. And Brenner saw that as an opportunity to take it off him, de-arm him and use it against him, and then take it for his own satisfaction keeping, and then clean it down as well. Because if it is Dylan's, it needs to be returned back. Because if people are looking for that and they find it on Brenner, they're going to think, well, Brenner's clearly responsible, right? So hence why it was returned back at a later point. Did it tie in line with the decoy of Kurt Wadsworth? No, because that was a few days before. So there's that to take in mind as an alternative factor. But yeah, it makes sense. If you've used a firearm, whether it's yours or stolen, could be of the victims, you're going to clean it down, whether it be to return back to the place of who it belonged to or just dispose of it completely. Because if it is ever found in the future, if anyone found traces that link back to you, you're done for. So it would make sense as to why Brenner would clean it down. So there's two different theories, either Brenner's own firearm disposed of or Dylan's firearm seen in a time lapse and then returned back to Dylan's trailer later on, days later. But as I said, the family couldn't identify it, nor did they. So it's a bit of a mystery. But I think <laughs> I'm actually quite surprised how I was able to summarise it all there. This is just a, a little example of what I'm capable of when I'm at 100% performance level. Hopefully I didn't talk too fast, it's just there's a lot to get through. Skeptical also says, your spring cleaning video is eye-opening. My mind is spinning with thoughts I've never had before as to why LE didn't officially consider the Grain Shed property a crime scene which no one would have been allowed in the area. The truck belonged to Dylan. Why wouldn't the parents remove the truck from the property immediately, like they did with Dylan's pickup truck? The LE was doing some kind of sting operation, watching from a distance to catch Brenner's movements. How did they allow Brenner to clean the grain truck? How did uh, allow spring cleaning? My stomach is turning, just like Dylan. It's grave. And I don't mean that in a way that Dylan may not be dead. M my quotes are that he was not being properly buried in a grave. Okay. Right, yeah. So... If it felt like the LE were a bit reluctant to take action on Brenner, were they incorporating it with the Dylan Rounds case or separate pending ones to catch Brenner in the act so there's a justified reason to apprehend him? On top of other charges, maybe. But to be honest, the LE, it is already pending charges, clear warrants, arrest warrants. Take him in as soon as possible. The only reason why it didn't happen in 2021 or... Yeah, 2021, pending warrant, is because of COVID. That was the excuse. Virus. Can't go out there. What about wearing a mask? Okay? So the excuse is, we'll let a potential killer, we'll let a violent individual on the loose, we won't take action because of a, a virus. Even though there can be forms of PPE protection against it, at least. 
an effort could be made, it wasn't by the LE. They already had reason to take Brenner in, unrelated to Dylan Rounds, which would have probably helped the case in general because if they did it quick enough on the 30th or the 31st or the 1st of June before the 2nd, spring cleaning would never have happened. And then we would have ultimately known what was in that shed and what would have been taken away, right? Moving on. Cleo, live, kept pausing, then play, but couldn't hear you. Right, strange. Maybe you refresh, open up a new tab, maybe. Sometimes on YouTube, Cleo, I've had two tabs open. One of watching YouTube short videos, the other tab watching normal format videos. And for some reason, all the sound of both videos playing at the same time, because both videos are playing at the same time through separate tabs, are only coming through one audio format, in which if I muted the volume of one of the tabs, both videos still play, of course, but the sound on both videos in separate tabs go muted. Makes no sense at all. Normally, if you've got two separate tabs open of two separate videos, if you mute one of the tabs, you won't hear it anymore. The other tab, you'll still hear the volume. That's not happened in recent time. So I think there's been some glitches with YouTube. Ronald, Montello is a crime scene, I know. Okay, fair enough. Sunny Productions. Finally, Chase Fenstra update. Well, there you go, Sunny. Shout out to Glenn. Oh, a couple more comments here. Give me a second. <laughs> I've got a bit of a dry mouth. I need to uh, drink some more water. Give me a second. Mm. This is definitely an oral workout with all this talking. Right. Skeptical. Thanks, Raf. You're welcome. The Chase Venture timeline is interesting. I was hoping there would be something written about the night he encountered Dylan. Do we know the exact location? I imagine it was closer to the Nevada border near Montello instead of in Lucin near Dylan's farm. Chase Venture timeline. Right. Okay. The night he encountered Dylan. Do we know the exact location? Are you what day are you talking about in terms of the timeline? Are you talk about the twenty fifth of May, or are you talking about the twenty eighth? The twenty eighth. Well, first of all, twenty eighth of May, Chase Fenstra, seven o one a.m. at Flying J Snowville's. Later on in the day, near lunchtime at Clinton, Utah, at KFC, getting some chicken. Later on. 10.30 p.m. Ogden scene at Little Caesars Pizza. Okay. Yeah, there's there's blank spots in between those time stamps, of course. Now, as for Chase Fenstra on the 25th, it was never mentioned what time, but I'm assuming it's morning to mid-afternoon. Correct me if I'm wrong. Sun says, highlight Warlight Ralph, you are so thorough, very interesting, good, informative video. I remember seeing a video of Venstra playing a guitar, singing a country song. Really? Where did you see that? Interesting. It's sad to see how a person can ruin their life. I think Venstra could provide a lot of information about Don Hatley and Ed Harshberger and Bibbins to the LE. Thank you. You're welcome, Sun. So, whilst I may not always respond back to people's comments physically... I do it in these videos, which can be of high importance because it opens up new discussions. And sometimes, to be honest, like these comments, it's so much easier to respond back me talking than typing because it's just more efficient and you see how it works. So that seems to be it of all the comments there. A big shout out to Skeptical for catching up and spending the time to write all these comments and shout out to Sun as well and uh, Weezer too. So, in my opinion, this video is of great value and importance to the Dylan Rounds case because not only does it acknowledge previous points and claims made, also uses common sense as well, just to tie it all in together upon a various amount of events, but being able to tie it all in one right now, but that's only because of the time spent back then individually looking at it now. To be honest, I can do it as a standalone video and a prompting question. I did highlight it here about possibilities of the time-lapse footage video of Brenner cleaning a gun. Was that used in the murder of Dylan? And who did it belong to, Dylan or Brenner himself or someone else's stolen? 
That can be a separate video. Maybe it's been talked about in other videos, but a dedicated one will focus in on that theme. And that's what you'll see in recent time. Focused themed videos. Besides all the other stuff, let's focus in one thing at a time or now look back at it one at a time for the additional points and questions. And of course, the comments and questions by people in the chat in the comment section does help a lot and it does help the Dylan Rounds case because it does keep it alive in general and it keeps certain events within the case alive, relevant and carries importance there. So it's all good, it's all under control. Now, last night or the night before, we saw the odd character show up in the chat, although extremely brief, it did happen. It is what it is. Now, there is irony behind it because at the times of when I might do a video saying, the community is so much better now, of course bad people will come along to counter that. It's just ironic, it's coincidences with life. I know about it in real life. Kind of like how if something good happens, if I celebrate or get too happy or too excited, it's quickly replaced with a negative, a bad thing happens. I have tested it over and over again and the same result occurs. So unfortunately, I've got to keep the at times excitedness in here and have a straight face to prevent things from going wrong. It is what it is. So like with the Dylan Rounds case, if I hype it up too much or if I get too positive or too positive about people, there's higher chances things go wrong. So that's why I've got to be very careful and uh, it's not always easy to do, okay? You gotta contain, you gotta be at a base level. It can be a form of energy conservation, but also cons conserving luck, conserving or avoiding bad luck. People can say superstition, whatever. If it's like a factual event for witnessed by an individual on repeated occasions, I think that's more than enough. It's telling there is something going on. That can apply to anywhere in life as a heads up there. So I think we'll leave it as that. It was a heavy discussion, a lot talked about. For a simple video looking back at comments, you can see how important it really is. And it's also good how other people have such a good memory on this case and can even remember things I may not be able to remember at times. When you're in the presence of other people that can think individually but still remember stuff to support a claim, a point, whatever, to back something up, the more people with a better memory, there's less pressure on yourself to remember it all. And there'll be times where you know something, they don't, they know something, you do. So that's how it works, that's how it should be. So that's all fine. So thanks for watching. Appreciate people's patience. See you next time, whenever that is. Goodbye, good night for now.